Every year during the week leading up to Labor Day, thousands of coders decamp from their polished offices in the bay for a week-long bacchanal in the Nevada desert. This is Burning Man, an annual drug-fueled gathering that has become as much the bedrock of Silicon Valley as Google and the iPhone. Although Burning Man only dates back to 1986, the relationship between the psychedelic culture and Silicon Valley stretches back to the 1950s. In fact, the creativity sparked by computer engineers on LSD trips may have been the source for many of the ideas that drove the personal computing revolution and led to the creation of the internet. In the mid-1950s, the Bay Area was a lot different than it is today. Thanks to beat authors like Ginsburg and Kerouac, San Francisco became a refuge for the emerging post-war counterculture. It was, in many respects, an unlikely area for the birth of the anti-establishment movement. Just down the road at Palo Alto, government researchers were busy at Stanford plotting the future of computing with an eye on its military applications. By the 1960s, most of this research was split between two labs in Palo Alto. The Augmented Human Intellect Research Center at the Stanford Research Institute, headed by Douglas Engelbert, and the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or SAIL, run by John McCarthy. Both of these labs are now famous in their own right for their pioneering work on computers, but at the time they were seen as pursuing very different goals. Engelbart's lab was focused on using computers to augment the human brain. McCarthy's was pursuing computing as a way to replace it. Although the computer was seen as a tool of the man in the 1950s, the engineers who worked on these hulking machines at university laboratories couldn't help but be exposed to countercultural elements in the Bay Area, or its drug of choice, LSD. Interestingly enough, when LSD first hit the Palo Alto scene in the mid-1950s, it didn't carry the same stigma that it does today. In fact, its widespread adoption can be attributed as much to a cadre of engineers and scientists who believed it might help unlock latent creative potential as to the beatniks and hippies. But none of them would have likely heard about it at all if it weren't for an electrical engineer named Myron Stolaroff. After working as a civil engineer in the Navy during World War II, Stolaroff spent the next 15 years working on audio equipment at the California-based electronics manufacturer, Ampex. In the mid-1950s, Stolaroff fell in with a small religious group run by another Stanford professor, Harry Rathbun, who would hold regular retreats at his cabin in the woods. At these meetings, later known as the Sequoia Seminars, Stolaroff met an Irish writer named Gerald Hurd, the man credited with introducing Huxley to Eastern religious thought. When Stolaroff was in the Los Angeles area, he would make a point to visit Hurd, and during one of his trips in 1956, Hurd told him about a new drug called LSD. Hurd had been introduced to the drug by a man named Al Hubbard, who had administered the substance to both him and Huxley while visiting from Canada. Later that year, Stolaroff would end up taking LSD in Hubbard's apartment. According to John Markoff's book, Stolaroff's experience was a deeply religious event, and at the same time, he felt that he had plunged deeply into his own unconscious mind. Following this pivotal experience, Stolaroff broke off from the Sequoia Seminars and formed a separate group as a way to conduct research on LSD. He invited a number of prominent computer engineers he knew to take part. As Markoff recounts, the study group set in motion an unheralded but significant reign of events plunging a small group of technologists into the world of psychedelics almost a decade before LSD became a standard recreational drug on American college campuses. Unsurprisingly, the board members at Ampex weren't huge fans of Stolaroff's LSD-fueled study groups, and Stolaroff left the company in 1961. That same year, he funded the creation of the International Foundation for Advanced Study, or IFAS, where he would do LSD experiments on some of the best engineers in Silicon Valley. In this respect, Stolaroff's vision for the IFAS was much different than the research being conducted on LSD at a handful of hospitals in the United States and Canada at the time. Instead of research being run by medical professionals, the IFAS was created under the auspices of computer engineers. 
One of the foremost research questions at the Institute was the effect of LSD on creativity. In particular, Stolaroff and his colleagues wanted to discover whether acid could be used as a catalyst to achieve breakthroughs on technical problems. Stolaroff's institute was a natural attractor for those in Silicon Valley who were also exploring the mind with computers. Among them was Doug Engelbart, director of the Stanford Research Institute. Engelbart participated in an early experiment on LSD and creativity at the IFAS, and according to Markov, he remained virtually catatonic for the duration of his trip, spending most of it staring at a wall. Still, Engelbart seemed to enjoy the experience and suggested that Stolaroff organize a study solely with engineers to see if LSD could help them invent something. Although this experiment did come to pass and involved eight engineers, the results were less than amazing. The best thing Engelbart ended up inventing, according to Markov, was a small device to help toilet train children. Still, the mind-expanding properties of LSD began to seep into the culture of the Stanford Research Institute, which quickly developed a reputation with Silicon Valley. As Markov notes, Engelbart's researchers came to be seen as the lunatic fringe. In the midst of this engineer's world of crew cuts and white shirts and ties arrived a tiny band distinguished by their long hair and beards, rooms carpeted with oriental rugs, women without bras, jugs of wine, and on occasion the wafting of marijuana smoke. Engelbart's methods may have been unorthodox, but they produced results. If you've ever used a computer mouse, you can thank Engelbart, who unveiled this computer interface at the mother of all demos in 1968, an achievement that came directly out of the freewheeling Stanford Research Institute of the mid-60s. LSD's influence wasn't just limited to Engelbart's lab, however. Its friendly competitor, the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, quickly developed its own reputation for its devil-may-care approach to computer engineering. By the late 1960s, researchers at SAIL were working on a project for the government called ARPANET, which would lay the foundations for the modern internet. At the same time, Markov recounts many people at SAIL were busy exploring psychedelics and other drugs while creating cyberspace. Indeed, students would often complain of the cannabis smoke clouding up the lab, which led to a rule that pot had to be smoked outside. One of the computer scientists working at the lab developed such a reputation for dropping his pot seeds on the computer equipment that his nickname became Johnny Potseed. Over time, the drug-fueled culture of this largely government-funded lab was reined in by higher-ups at Stanford, but not before they succeeded in creating ARPANET, a way to digitally send information between computers in distant locations. In 1969, ARPANET was used to send a short message from UCLA to the Stanford Research Institute thereby paving the way for the modern web. Not long after, students at Stanford made history in another way by using ARPANET to sell an undisclosed amount of cannabis to students at MIT. It will go down in history as the first commercial transaction on the internet. Sales unorthodox lab environment became a magnet to a new generation of computer geeks who were attracted by its laid-back atmosphere that somehow still produced cutting-edge research. Among those who began poking around the lab in the early 70s were young Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who would launch Apple by the end of the decade. Unsurprisingly, the influence of psychedelics can also be seen in Apple computers. In 2001, Markov interviewed Steve Jobs, who had just finished a demo of iTunes, a new music platform specific to Apple computers. The program included a visualization that created trippy patterns on the computer screen. What if we could see music? What would it look like? When Jobs told Markov that the screen reminded him of his youth, Markov mentioned some of the other Silicon Valley pioneers who had indulged in psychedelics in the 60s and 70s. Was Jobs by chance referring to something similar? He explained that he still believed that taking LSD was one of the two or three most important things he had done in his life. And he said that he felt that because people he knew well had not tried psychedelics and there were things about him they couldn't understand. He also said that his countercultural roots often left him feeling like an outsider in the corporate world of which he is now a leader. As in so many other respects, Jobs' position on psychedelics was ahead of his time. These days, the psychedelic legacy of the 60s is present in so many of our digital devices. We can use Bitcoin and other digital currencies to buy drugs from websites on the dark web. Virtual reality can create hallucinations without drugs. 
and now microdosing LSD is the hot new business trip in Silicon Valley. The Stanford AI lab may be cleared of cannabis smoke, but the legacy of the early psychonauts of Silicon Valley continues to haunt every corner of the internet. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. I do want to give a huge shout out to Prohibited.com and Daniel Oberhaus. Daniel is the one who wrote this blog. Prohibited is the site that it's on. I'll leave a link in the description in the top pinned comment. Thanks again. Much love. Be happy. Be yourself. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.